Welcome back to Beyond the Briefing. It is Monday, the 24th of October. We are 15 days out from the midterm elections. Man, it's getting hot out there. And I'm not talking about the temperature. The momentum is definitely going to the Republican side. It is amazing to see the media actually paying attention to reality. I've, been, I, I've come up with a new term. I'm going to call people reality deniers. Um, they keep talking about election deniers and science deniers and all that because the red wave is getting bigger and bigger. And the media is somehow something we've been talking about for a long time, as you know. And they, they somehow think that somehow it just happened in the last 24, 72 hours. Um, anyway, just five big issues to go over today. I'll give you a quick heads up. We're going to talk about the midterms, what to expect in these final 15 days. We're talking about voter turnout or what the left likes to call voter suppression. Uh, quick update on the Durham investigation. And then I want to talk a little bit about the courts and the Biden student debt relief and what's going on there. Because it's actually interesting. There's two things that happened, a little bit of confusion. And last, obviously, it's a Monday, so we're going to talk a little media. All right, let's start with the midterms. So the party, if you're not familiar, and I apologize if, if, uh, if you know this already, but I just want to make sure everyone understands. I, I There are three big committees in Washington, D.C., if you will. There's the RNC, the National Committee. Uh, that oversees the party writ large. They write the rules. They oversee the national environment and um, help do some fundraising for for the the overall party structure. They really play big in presidential elections and then um, do a lot of the mechanics, like get out the vote and the data operation, et cetera. That's neither here nor there. Then there are two campaign committees, the NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Campaign, and the NRSC, the National Republican Senatorial Committee. They basically are the campaign arms that elect, reelect members of the House. The NRCC and the NRSC does that for the Senate. And there's a Democratic counterpart for all three. There's also state stuff um, that deals with state races, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So the the job of there's a chairman of of all of these and in the house side he's a member of congress right so on the dem side there's a guy by the name of sean patrick Owen. he's a congressman from new york he is the chair of the what we call much the d trip the d triple c the democratic congressional campaign committee his job is to get democrats reelected and or elected if you're a new person and he there's this whole redistricting thing in new york if you've been following that he basically jumped into a current congressman's district after redistricting, forced them out, and said, I'm going to run in this. There was a part of his old district anyway, but he wanted to he cherry-picked what he thought was going to be the better district for him and pushed this other member of Congress out. A lot of consternation. Well, so the funny part about this is Sean Patrick Maloney is probably – I not probably. Why, let's not mince words. He's going to lose on election night. The chairman of the DCCC will lose. And he ran on a platform when he asked his colleagues in the Democratic caucus to elect him by saying, you know, history says that we're not going to do well. Well, you know what? I don't really care about that. I'm going to give up, raise us the money and do all the things that we need to do so that we we win. And he was on this week uh, yesterday on ABC. And they they basically said, here's what you said when you ran for this position and your colleagues elected you. And now, you know, the House looks like it's going Republican. He said, you know what? I, you know, the people haven't voted yet. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, but the reason that I think it's really interesting is because he's going to lose his own seat. And, and, and this is, these are all seats, by the way, this is New York folks. we talked about Rhode Island. We had, um, you know, and, and some of these seats were um, Biden carry, right? This is a democratic congressman in New York. Who's head of the campaign committee. He is going to lose. That tells you a lot about where, where things stand. Um, I, I, I think, you, you know, wherever you look, Democrats right now, they're, they're struggling with Hispanics. They're struggling with black men in particular to get them in, engaged and turned out. And I, I mean, like, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out why. You look around, as I've said to people, tell me what's going well, right? Inflation, gas prices, food prices. You know, the, the geopolitical environment. I mean, you've got China saber rattling, North Korea is firing off nukes, Iran is being provocative, Ukraine. I mean, Biden came in as the adult in the room and he's he blown up everything. I mean, he literally had a clip. I'm going to try to put this out on social media today over and over again. And he was asked, um, you know, about, you know, where everything stood. And he said, 
look at where thing what I inherited and look at where things are now. And I'm like, okay, inflation was 1.4. It's at 8.2. Look at where gas prices are. Look at where interest rates were. I mean, all of those things. I mean, there's nothing like what do you, I, I don't know that you want to remind people, but hey, God bless you. Do it. Um, there was a poll out that I thought was interesting. It's from Politico that the AP had done. It says only about half of Americans have high confidence that votes in the upcoming midterm elections will be counted accurately. Wow. Um, I, I actually ran the same poll on Twitter. I do this on Thursdays if you ever want to jump in on the action and ask the same question. Only 22% say they had confidence. And I get that. I, I know there's a lot of concerns, and so don't. But I'm just saying that like, that does not bode well. Like that, I, I get the concern. Um, I'm not dismissing people who, who question after what the Democrats did last time with changing the rules and, and extending deadlines and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's amazing that that's what it, things have come to. Um, I, I've, we've continued to see the shift that we've talked about now for weeks happen all over the country. Uh, I mentioned Lee Zeldin last week, the running for New York governor. Keep an eye on that one. Um, the, the Senate is looking you know, better and better. I, I still think Georgia is going to the runoff. Um, I, as I mentioned last week, next week, I'm going to try to do use this podcast both on Monday and Thursday to really do a deep dive into the races. If you're, if you're going to be out or, you know, if, if politics is something that you um, are going to be chatting with people about, or if you just really care about it, I want to deep dive into some of these races and kind of give you a, a, my idea of how things are going to shake out. Um, so tune into both market calendars. You know, uh, hopefully I'll give you my rationale because I, I also think that I, I, I'll leave it on this note. I, I've said this to my colleagues um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention this to you. Two, two quick points. Number one, mechanics matter. What do I mean by that? You still, no matter the environment, no matter how bad your opponent is, no matter who's endorsed, you still have to run a campaign. You still need to raise money. You still need to get people knocking on doors. You still need to do all of those traditional things. There's a lot of candidates around the country that aren't doing that. And I hate to say that, but it's just at some point in a close race, you can't just wing it. And I think there are too many candidates that just, um, that I've seen that had they run a better race, could have won. I'll leave it at that. The other thing is, and you, I, another, you know, I've, I've talked about this over and over again, that people vote for two main reasons, their economic security and their personal security. Those are very broad things. And if you saw the headlines this weekend, Washington, D.C., New York, Chicago, crime, crime, crime continues to be a problem. Just and, and it's not just you don't have to live in the city. I mean, they're getting shared all over these brazen attacks, people getting carjacked, um, people breaking into you know the houses and starting street fights. It's you you just don't get the sense of safety. And I, I don't I think people are saying enough's enough. The last thing I'll say is this. One thing that I don't think pollsters are looking for, because I don't know how they, they need to get their head around, but I find it in conversations over and over again. And I know for folks on the right, we 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 probably put this in this we call it wokeness bucket. Okay, what I mean by this is the following: I think the left has gone too far. Okay, so and 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 I I, I say that because it's not one thing. It's it's every person has has a different line or a different experience. Okay, and so. I know I was talking to a couple parents um, a couple weeks ago, and they're fairly open-minded people. I would definitely not put them in the, the the MAGA category. I don't think I'd even put them in the conservative category. And they were talking about how their kid who's in elementary school was being pressured about what they wanted to be called and their pronouns, whatever. And the kid was kind of like, you know, call me by my name and whatever. And, and the, te- the the teachers just won't let it go, right? They kept being like, well, you got to do something. And, and, and the parents were like, why, why are they – like they, they were getting all frus- frustrated. And that's kind of – so for that parent, that was their threshold, right? For somebody else, it's it may be this – you know, I, I, I've talked to more conservative people who are like, oh, it's the transgender, you know, surgeries and stuff, whatever. I think everybody's got a different 
fill in the blank, the, the, the sort of what the left is trying to do, but they've just jumped the shark. They've gone too far. And I, I don't think that's showing up in polls. And I think people have had enough. And this, this is, this is taps into immigration and pronouns and all of this equality. It's, it's like, it's one thing to be respectful of people, right? Uh, it's the CRT stuff. It's just this idea of jamming it down everyone's throat and making everyone conform to these leftist, nutty, progressive, crazy ideas. And I think for a lot of people who aren't even really that conservative, they'll say, hey, I don't mind being respectful or this isn't a big deal, but why are you jamming it in front of me? Why won't you let it go? And, and I think that's what I mean by they've gone too far. And it's not showing up in polls because it's tough to ask. But I'm telling you, it's, 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 it's driving people. All right. I want to get to what the left likes to call voter suppression. We are seeing record turnout for a midterm election, okay? Record. And yet CNN and other places still keep calling these laws, which make you show an ID, God forbid, restrictive. I don't understand how – if it's – you're getting the higher than presidential turnout in a midterm election and – and you know, upwards of a hundred and ten percent more than the last midterm. How is that restrictive? It doesn't. It defies logic. I mean, by the way, this goes back to what I was just saying a moment ago. It's it's they've gone too far. You can't keep something restrictive if the number of people going are exponentially more than participated last time. That can't be the case. And yet, all of these people early voting are showing that the participation rate is higher. I will say this one last note on voting. Make a plan. Get out and vote. I know a lot of people love to vote on election day. I've got to be in New York for coverage on Newsmax. So I will go in person in Virginia. We've been able to vote since September 23rd. We can, you know, mail or whatever, but I we can there's actually a little you can go to the registrar's office in Virginia, down in Alexandria, Virginia, where uh, not, not far from where I actually dropped my kids off for school when I do carpool. I'm going to the next time I do that. I'm going to go in and vote. I, I just want to get it done. And it, look, here's the point. When you vote early, you're saving the candidate and the party a ton of money. They, they don't have to chase you. They're not spending money on phone calls and mail, whatever, and saying, okay, we've got to make sure you vote. And I've talked to enough people that are like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to give the Dems a head. Up. Guess what? Get out there. Lock it in. Let's overwhelm them with the number of people. Like, just do it. Get out there because at some point they – what happens is on election day, that means that the party apparatus, the candidates, have to sit there and make sure, okay, you know, I'm gonna, they, it's called AB chase, absentee ballot, EV, early vote chase. They're going to start, hey, we, we, we haven't seen your – you know, you go out and cast your ballot, so do you need a ride to the poll? We're going to waste time and resources to make sure you vote. So if you can cast that ballot early, do it. And if you're not – if you don't – if you're skeptical – or whatever, then have a plan and say, okay, on election day, I'm going to do it. But make sure that you that you have a plan so that you don't go, you know, I, I know sometimes people get into work and they go, oh my gosh, you know, I, I couldn't, then I couldn't get back in time. Don't leave it to chance. Anyway, enough said. I want to move on quickly to um, the, the, the special counsel Durham investigation. Look, this has been a little bit of a bouncing ball to follow, but basically – Durham was appointed special counsel by by former Attorney General Bill Barr to look into the whole Steele dossier and the Russia, 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 and the FBI origins. He ended up prosecuting two people. The last one is this guy, Igor Denchenko, who basically – not basically. He admitted that he lied to the FBI, and yet he got acquitted last week, which is insane. The idea that you, know, you can basically you – know, all the evidence was there that he lied, and yet whatever. Um. And then former Clinton campaign attorney Michael Sussman was found not guilty in June. But this is it, guys. I mean, now we can do the investigations when Republicans take over. But I got to say, um, one news outlet said I raged last week. I don't think I raged um, because I know what rage looks like. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, yeah, am I disappointed? Absolutely. I don't know how you can't be. I mean, we know that this thing was made up. We know that the FBI paid a million dollars for. To, for this guy to be an informant, we know that they lied about all this stuff. And and think about how much taxpayer money was wasted, what it did to President Trump's term in terms of tarnishing uh, and and resources, and how many private citizens got dragged into it. What a waste! 
and nothing comes of it. No one's held accountable. I just, to me, I, I, I'm, I'm sorely disappointed in this whole thing. And I, anyway, I, I just, I, I find it amazing. You know, Steve Bannon gets sentenced to four months in $6,500 crime for lying to or defying a subpoena. Defying a subpoena, right? And you had Eric Holder and Lois Lerner both defy subpoenas previously from Congress. Nothing happens to them. Nada. Then you got Comey and Clapper, these guys who lied to Congress. Nada. Bannon defies a subpoena from the January 6th committee, and they sentence him to four months in prison. And these guys from the Steele dossier get off. I mean, it just, I, what happened to equal justice? It's just funny. I mean, I, again, it's, there's this, for all the talk about, you know, justice, judicial reform, it seems to me that if you're on the left and if you go riot or if you go lie or you do whatever, and you're on the left, you get away with it. If you're on the right, you go to jail. Or you get convicted, or whatever he's ending up doing. But it's amazing. Anyway, think about that. Um, I want to catch you up to speed on the action that's being taken on student loans and what's going on. So early last, not early last week, the first thing that happened last week was there was a case that came from Wisconsin. It went up to the Supreme Court. It went up, and Amy Coney Barrett rejected the request for emergent, for an emergency application to block the student debt relief. The folks that I talked to, the the lawyers, basically said that that case was flawed. It was never going to happen. It just they didn't have standing. They didn't prove. Um, and this is sort of a legal term, and this is you know way over my head. But basically, they had to prove that they had standing in the court that they were an injured party, and they didn't. And the 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 people that I know that do know this. Were telling me that it was it was flawed from the jump and and but so you go okay so the wait a second what was it that I heard well what you heard was that there was a separate case uh, that came out of Nebraska and the thing and again why did they have standing because this is so the issue is how the student loan was funded and the idea is that Nebraska under this old formula is partially on the hook so. Nebraska saying, "Hey, we are an aggrieved party because when you, uh, when you, um, uh, take this money away and just relieve it, then we, Nebraska, are on the hook, basically. So therefore, we have we have standing because we're an aggrieved party. So, and the Eighth Circuit stayed that. Does that make sense? Because the there's the court is saying, oh, okay, you, Nebraska, are going to get, you know, have the you know potential that you get financially." screwed on this deal. So we will give you standing. They put an emergency set. The thing that I think is ironic is that I, Biden did this whole deal so that he could have something to wave at young voters before a midterm. And so they're blocking this thing right before. So it's it'll be interesting to see how it played out because they got screwed. They tried to pull a cute one. And then I'll talk about, I'll, I'll leave the media part of this for the net, for the last block in just a sec, but there is a little twist in this. Um, one more other court news, I'm going to sneak this into the court block here, is um, Eric Schmidt, who's the Missouri Attorney General, uh, announced that the court took his application. Missouri is suing um, because they're saying that there's a collusion between big tech and the government to suppress free speech. Uh, when it came to COVID and what you couldn't couldn't say, so here's the kicker: he, the court has granted him the ability to depose Fauci and former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. I think this will be amazing. Uh, this is like made for TV stuff, so keep an eye on that one. All right, last block as we usually do on Mondays is to talk a little bit about the media. A lot to get to. Um, start with the speaker. Nancy Pelosi in an interview says that she doesn't subscribe to polls that say Americans trust Republicans more than Democrats. She didn't subscribe to – she literally in the interview just – so the, the, the um, I believe it was Jonathan Capehart who we'll get to in a minute. I think she was on with him as well. And he says, you know, these polls say the following. She says, I don't subscribe to what you're saying. And it's like he, he's not – felt like a, he, it's an opinion. He was literally like, here are the polls – Here's what they say. And she says, I don't subscribe. I, and I'm like, you don't subscribe. The, you, you may not agree. Um, you, you, know, you may counter or whatever. But it was just a, such an interesting and odd 
thing to hear the Speaker of the House say, um, and obviously no pushback. She also said at, at, in separately that when, and this is, I believe, on CBS, um, she was on with uh, the, their Sunday show, and she said, when people talk about inflation, we have to change the subject. And the Dems, you see this, um, Ali Velshi, by the way, who is another genius over there at, at um, MSNBC, he, he keeps talking um, about the great inflation myth. And this is kind of what Pelosi was trying to talk about. Is that they're saying, oh, it, it, it's the, there's a myth. It's inflation system because it's a worldwide thing. It's all over the world. Everyone's dealing with it. First of all, of course, there's, everyone's dealing with some extent. But like we've put up the charts before in the show. This we're, we're by far, when it comes to developed countries, well ahead of everybody else. Well ahead of them. So this idea that it, it, I mean, it's just, it's not true, right? Number two, their policies, and I know, and this is where like Ali Velsh is like, oh, well, it's, it's the, the Republicans trying to pin this on the Democrats and Biden is ridiculous. No, it's not. Like, there are plenty of economists. You, you pass trillions of dollars in spending, that is going to have an inflationary response. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, you may not agree with that. I mean, there's economists who can disagree, but there's, I, I just don't know that, that, why that's that shocking to say. When you pump that much money into, um, and then you don't do the right things policy wise, and and again, you look at our climb. These are the guys who said it was transitory. I mean, that, it's just amazing, and they're basically saying we just need to pivot out of it. Of course you do. I get it. You're going to lose. You're going to get killed in this election. You don't want to talk about it. I understand this, but they are so tone deaf when it comes to inflation. And what I I, I just want to say this because again, I'm not in the business of giving Democrats advice. Where they're where they're screwing this up is if I were advising a client, what I would say is it's it's everyone sees it every day. You walk down the street, you see inflation. You you know, I, I mean shopping the other day, you're looking at like I wanted to buy a grapefruit. I think I mentioned this the other day, it was two dollars and nineteen cents for one grapefruit. I mean that's just and you think about it, like you walk through it and every time you see a price, you're like, wow, that costs that. We had a box of crackers the other day that, you know, it's, it's like, and it was like $5.49 for this little box of crackers. And I'm like, holy smokes. I mean, it's just every, I mean, you get sticker shock at the grocery store on, on staples, you know, on, I mean, not literally the staples in a gun, but like sta- sta- items that you'd normally just buy. And you go, wow, do I really need that this week? And Pelosi's telling me we just need to pivot. The problem is you don't need to pivot. You need to present voters or people. With a message that says, hey, we get it. Here's what we're doing. The problem is they can't because they don't have a plan. But they're, they're, they've been messaging this thing wrong all along. Um, two, two other big ones. Tapper, Jake Tapper, this said this weekend, he had an interview with Jeb Bush. He said, we have to have a national conversation on, on the damage that, you know, the COVID and pulling kids out of school had on kids. And I'm like, we have to have a – brother – We've been having that conversation. I mean, on my show, we probably talk about it. I mean, on Newsmax, we talk about it on a network all the time. On my show, we've probably talked about it at least a couple times a week, especially during the height of COVID, maybe more. Where, where are these guys? What, what hole do they live in? We need to have a national conversation. Well, we've been talking about opening schools since, I mean, Trump was talking about keeping everything open. These are the shutdown people. And so they're like, oh, we need to have a conversation about the damage. Oh, my gosh. Where have you been? Welcome. Thanks for coming. Holy smokes. It's just, these are the people that, so many people were lying to get news and they're like, um, we should have a conversation. Oh my gosh. Uh, I do want to say this. Biden had two epic interviews. I mentioned this earlier, uh, this Capehart interview that Biden Biden did with John the Capehart at MSNBC. Um, the thing that I thought was fascinating. So if you haven't seen it, I have it up on my Twitter page and on Instagram as well. He, Biden gets asked, by John the Gabbard, if he's going to run for re-election. And he says, you know, this is something that we're thinking about, blah, 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 blah. Um, and he he falls asleep during the interview. I mean, and, and the, the, like the mainstream media basically just ignored this. It was like state television. If you're watching, if you're listening to this today, we're going to cover, um, we're, we'll play it tonight on Spice Ring Company. Tune in. Um, and Newsmax has been doing a, a lot of the shows have been played as well, but it's, it's embarrassing. Um, and then he did this, I, you know, I mentioned this, um, 
last week on the show where I got tipped off. They were doing this town hall and it's how the White House has been kept off his schedule. It finally aired, um, it's called like This News or This News Now or something. And, and they aired it over the weekend. It was all this like woke leftist stuff. And they and they put it out. And, and Biden just gave a bunch of crazy like answers that a lot of mistruths, and including one where he said the student loan program passed by one vote or one, could just a couple of votes in Congress. I'm like, dude, dude, it never went through Congress. Obviously, I mentioned the court thing a minute ago. But he, he did it by executive order. And he's trying to tell these kids, oh, it only passed by like two votes in Congress. I'm like, dude. You, that's either you really are that out there or you just lied to them. But again, no comment, no nothing. Unbelievable. And it was pretty, and not to mention, I mean, if you actually are interested, go to my Twitter feed or go to RNC research. They put out a bunch of the clips, the stuff that he's saying. I mean, I get you, you need to keep your base happy, but Holy smokes. It was, it was nuts. Anyway, uh, that about does it for today. Uh, tune in on Thursday. Another great conversation. And then as I said, next week, we're really going to start to, to delve down into these uh, into the midterms, House, Senate, so maybe even talk a little gov. Anyway, I hope you have a great week. Tune in every night, five o'clock, Newsmax to see Spicer and Company. We can go through a lot more, but uh, thanks for downloading, subscribing, reviewing, sharing. Thank you all. See you on Thursday. 